Hello! And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your <laughs> one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Rebar INF Games. Hoping, I'm hoping I got that name right. Creators you did. Of, it creators great. of the upcoming game of Mecha and Elemental Dinosaurs, The Crushing Thunder. The one and only Jeffrey Hartman. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you for thank you for coming on, and th thank you for being willing to brave the hell of time zones to arrive at the temple. And it's a nice place you got here. Mm -hmm. It's very spacious. Yep. Um. So I'll, I'll I like to start with the humble beginnings in these things. So, walk me through your first introduction to, um, t to um, tabletop gaming, and what was it that made it stick? Well. My first, this funny stories, which are really good. Um, so funny stories, my first interaction with tabletop RPGs happened basically back in college, which is a while ago. I was living in a dorm, you know, walking around. I didn't know much about it. I had uh, come up from a very conservative upbringing, so I didn't have a lot of chances to get into tabletop gaming. But mm -hmm. I was invited to a game, sat there, and... I made this uh, ranger that used kukris and, you know, stabbed things to death. Well, mm -hmm. the GM had thrown us up against some kind of iron golem. So the most damage I could do to it was two. Period. And so, needless to say, it was not a very, very gratifying. At first I thought, you know, huh, this is interesting, but uh, kind of boring. But as I began to think about it and met other people and, you know, got the player's handbook and started to realize I could tell my own stories that other people could interact in and they, in turn, would tell me their stories, it just kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. The ability to share a life with someone else in a completely unique way. Kind of like, you know, if you write a story, you can't really judge the reactions of those people when you're writing the book. But if you're playing a tabletop RPG, you are experiencing the reaction to your story firsthand. Mm -hmm. And that was what hooked me, was the ability to portray that to others and have them enjoy that. Yeah. Now, when it, com now um, when, it comes to some when it comes to a concept like the Crushing Thunder, this idea of, of, mi of mixing... Um, of mixing mechs and and dinosaurs. Um, now, first first off, the concept of mechs is one that is one that is rife with different forms of interpretation, from the spiky to the stompy. Um, what was your particular introduction to the to the weird and wacky world of giant robots? My first interaction. I know I'm going to get you know. Uh ruined in the comments, is um, basically, I forget what it was called. There was a there was a game where you basically sat in the pilot seat of a mech and, you know, roamed around and blew up, like, Mech Warrior, was it, I believe? Yes. That's probably... That yeah, it... And that's, that's a whole that's a whole can of worms in and of itself. Yeah. That was my first introduction to mechs was basically riding around in giant robots shooting missiles at people and, you know, trying to be better at the game. And pro and probably getting you probably getting yourself sh probably getting yourself shot at and get and getting blown up repeatedly because well it well it is what it is. And oh also um also being ter being terrified of urban mechs. Yes. Just coming around a corner and blam dead. It's it's funny. It's funny you mentioned Mech Warrior since we're on the since everybody everybody in the bat in the BattleTech community a few days ago was making um, was making memes about the Battle of Tudyuk. Ah. <laughs> I e I e the, the moment where the moment where Comstar decided to get off their ass and do something about those clanners. Finally. 
Yeah, it only took only took them trying to trying to invade Terra to actually do something about it. Yeah, you would uh, you would hope once it gets to your front door, they would be willing to uh, put up or shut up. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's anyone, right? They yeah. Just uh... yeah, it's a case of hundreds hundreds of systems hundreds of systems in the hegemony are get are are getting it are getting attacked but are getting attacked by Kerensky's oh, um, rem- remnants. Yeah, I can deal with that later. Oh, they're attacking Terra. Okay, now shit's on. But yeah. with that kind of thing in mind, what I'd like you to walk me through the origin story, as it were, of the Crushing Thunder as an idea. Oh, that's always a really fun story. I love this story. I'm ready whenever you are. The story begins mm-hmm. as a buddy of mine has been working on a very, very detailed, like his own mech game Mm -hmm. for a while now. Um, And it's based off of Gundam. And, you know, it has all these different things. Very broad, very detailed, great game. It'll probably be coming out sometime. I don't know, so I'm not going to give any information Mm -hmm. because I don't know it. But from that, I started thinking, hey, I like giant robots. I should make my own giant robot game. And another friend of mine, we were just outside in the parking lot talking one day, and we're like, you know what? We should make our own game like he does. And so we started going back and forth, and so I thought, you know, what if there are dinosaurs? What if that's the reason that people would have mechs? And so we started making this world where, you know, there are these arenas where people fight, and they bring in dinosaurs and use mechs to battle them. And then we started going through the economy and, you know, talking about what this world was like. Well, later I started thinking, you know, Mechs have really big guns, and while dinosaurs are tough, and, you know, maybe they could have had skin like Kevlar, or, you know, scales and able to cover such a powerful creature as a T-Rex without tearing, might have some kind of strength, but they need to be stout. They need to be able to survive modern weaponry. Well, how would you do that? Well, if they were made of rock, then they would, or fire or water. And I was like, why not just make them elemental dinosaurs? Mm-hmm. What if... And so then I started grafting the story of Erd, how, you know, basically humans had wounded the world so much that the elemental father decided that uh, their time was up. So first he did actual dinosaurs, and then once they were started to get killed, he turned them into elementals. So the world of the game actually has both flesh dinosaurs and the elemental ones based on where you are was where Erd was actually focused on that region. Mm -hmm. So the players can kind of explore as the resistance out in the world, or they can stick to the arena cities where they use mechs to capture these horrible creatures in order to fight them to boost their own economy. You have the people that hide their head in the sand and the ones that actually walk around and try to make something of this new world. Yeah. Now, when you mention when you mention arenas and and the whole thing of capturing um, capturing dinosaurs in in them, what instantly comes to mind is how wild animals would would um, get loosed in uh, Roman gladiatorial arenas. Is it not far off from that kind of concept? Yes, it is very much like that style of concept. And another thing is that. With a concept li- with a concept like mech, that is a very broad brush, and because that's the reason why I mentioned the whole stompy and spiky, where you have the ones that are v- that very much act like tanks on legs, and the ones that act like powered armor. Um, works like gu- works like Gundam and the like would count would count as the latter, whereas um, BattleTech obviously is the former. Um, when it comes to the when it comes to the mechs in your in in the Crushing Thunder, where on the where on the paradigm would you say that they land? It really depends on the model that you have, because in the game there are actually you can have just normal vehicles, tanks, mm-hmm. scouting mechs, and then the battle mechs. Um, the mech that is in the main image would be one of the battle mechs. You know, a heavy, stompy type mech that has some room for maneuverability, but basically relies on its gun to get the job done more so than its actual piloting. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the Kickstarter page, I updated to the uh, Kickstarter edition cover, which has one of the scouting mechs fleeing from a group of molten raptors, basically lava raptors. And those are more of the uh, vein of the scouting mechs, the ones that are quicker and able to traverse long areas, maybe not relying on their armor so much as they are their maneuverability. Mm-hmm. Um, there are... S- oh. um, what I'm curious about is... How, is like when when I think of when I think of a bat when I think of a battle mech, I'm thinking of something that's going to be about 25 feet. Is that accurate? And would a um sc- would a scout be um equivalent in size to jumped up power armor? Um, normally in this world, it's a little bit different because if you look at a T Rex, like a bull T Rex had a standing hip height of around 13, 14 feet. So from this picture. The mech is about four feet taller than the hip of this T-Rex. So you can say that most of the mechs are around 17 feet tall. 17 to 20 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Um, The scouting mechs would be around, would might be glorified power armor at 12 to 13 feet tall. Some of them may be a similar height, but those would be more expensive models. Um, In the story, in the lore... The elemental lord of metal, going by both European and Eastern metal of the elements, such as, you know, wood, metal, fire, wind, water, earth. Mm -hmm. Um, He did not betray man. He sided with them. That's why, like, the the elementals don't usually have any metal in them. And mechs don't break down, guns didn't break down, tanks still work. You know, you would think an elemental lord with power over the elements would just unravel them. Well, the lord of metal sided with humans while the others were subjugated by Erd. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the... One thing that I'm curious about is the die system that that you've set up. The cascading D6. Which, if I'm not not mistaken, is a... um, is a, is essentially a d6 pyramid where you're rolling th- you're rolling 3 then 2 then 1 and this is a success based system with sixes exploding. Is that correct? Correct. Um what prompted this particular setup since this idea of cascading in th- in this regard is certainly uncommon. Um what kind of brought it about was the idea that whenever you were fighting well it all comes down to game balance, of course, mm-hmm. and the dev team is constantly, and me included, thinking of you know other particular options that may be viable, etc. But I wanted the attacks in the game to feel powerful, and like when you're playing like a mini war game like Warhammer, or you're playing something with a lot of D6 like Shadowrun, mm-hmm. um, the more you can roll the dice, the better you feel like in your mind mentally that you are doing, and so. With a cascade, it kind of scratches the itch of players making one roll, they fail, and they just feel that they were useless. But when you get three rolls in a row, you were never completely useless, and if all of them go off well, it feels really good, especially with the exploding dice. Mm-hmm. Now, and so when it com- now when it comes to sorry sorry to cut off, but when it comes to the um the, the die pyramid is it a case where no matter no matter how no matter what you're always rolling that pyramid no exceptions um you can do focused attacks and sort of penalize yourself of dice in order to do more s- specific effects mm-hmm. so say you wanted to roll 2d6 and then 1d6 to get guaranteed bonus damage is like an aim shot or say there was some kind of penalty that was preventing you from rolling it, but generally, in combat, you are rolling the dice pyramid. Alright. Um, now, with Shadowrun, the magic, num- the magic number to pass is four. Is that the case here? The magic number is three. <laughs> Alright, and that, that brings me to another thing, speaking of um, Shadowrun. Um, one of the special rules that it, that it has when, when it comes to failing or even successes is a glitch which is based which is based on how many um ones you ended up ro- you ended up rolling 
and it's basically the and but rule for Shadowrun. Um, since you mentioned sixes explode, is there any effect when ones are rolled, or is that, or is it just treated as a fail? Um, now, normally ones and twos are failures. Ones come into play based on the weapon that you are using. Um, if you're saying using a minigun or a storm cannon, etc., mm -hmm. and roll ones, the weapon can jam. It can back up. It can be com rendered completely useless depending on how many ones you might roll in that attack. Oh, all right. Now, when it now when it comes to when it come, one of the things I noticed in the um, te in the um, Google Doc that that you attach to the Kickstarter page, especially with the um, sample character, is a is a um, stat set up for both the character and for the mech. Now, when it comes to when it comes to character and mech creation, is it a case where the where it's full it's full freeform? Yes. So character and mech creation is freeform. You have a list of weapons. You have a list of armors. You have a list of um, special things you can put, and then you have your stats where you put your points to build yourself and the mech and what those stats will do. Yeah. Now within within that partic within that particular setup, um, there's there were a few questions that there were a few questions that I had on it. Um, the first is the um, special entry. Is that is that some is the special thing going to be something that's um, that that's a free that's a free form idea or are there a list of special effects that that you're going to be picking from at character creation? There will be um, it can be both. There will be a list of special effects that you can pick from with your mech at character creation, and then there will just be an open slot if the GM comes up with something to put in there. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm get I, I am. Now I'm guessing that I'm guessing that when it comes to that when it comes to die rolling, if you're ro if you're rolling say an attribute, um, that's deter that's de that determines the first row, when it comes to the die cascade. So if you'd so if somebody had a strength of four, they'd be ro they'd be rolling four dice and then go down from there. Um. One of the things that we're actually doing in uh, skill tests is we wanted to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And um, someone had uh, said that, why don't we just use the dice pyramid in combat and out of combat do it just linearly. As you know, you have a stat and then you roll and hit a score so that people can more focus on their battle. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't have to roll a whole bunch to figure out if I made it over this rock. I just want to get to shooting people. Yeah. Now, speaking of that, when it comes to combat, do you, does Crashing Thunder's combat lean more towards theater of the mind, or does it lean more towards um, a grid-based approach, or even a hex-based approach? It lends itself, I would say... To theater of the mind mm -hmm. it does have rigid you know movements for the mech and the abilities um and certain things may be added i mean the product won't necessarily go live till after the kickstart and even after that i think it's august or july and august for some of the projects but i digress um yes it is a more theater of the mind but it does have the rigid mechanics so that if someone was to use a grid or a board, they could measure things out and play that way. Now, when it comes to the stat, when it comes to the stats for the mech, I I'd like you I'd like you to go into each of them and and what they and what they kind of represent. I'm guess I'm guessing that the the four stats in it are are supposed to be analogous to the four stats for um the pilot, since in, mm -hmm. in the in the in the case of the pilot, they have strength, agility, intelligence, and charisma. The mech has core thrusters, AI, and paint job. Are they an are are the two analogous to each other, or is or are there some different things to take into account with the latter? 
there are some different things to take into account with the ladder with the mech and some of the things that have been tossed around is that paint job like you know humans have charisma we talk to each other correct well with the mech the paint job is basically your marketing score if you have a, like a paint job of four, that means you may have like four advertisements on yourself, and whenever people see you, you are basically wired currency for basically advertising. And so that whole part of you know business is still business exists in this world. And so if you're coming from a city and you walk in and have all these different you know brands on you, you're like, oh, so people still exist, and I can still get this here. Hey, thanks for letting me know. Mm-hmm. Um, and also in arena fights, you can use a flamethrower, melt someone's paint off, and then you're just hitting them in the wallet like a jerk. <laughs> don't give, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> um, and, and then AI, um, you know, normally you have intelligence, and the pilot is the one actually controlling the mech. What AI does is can give you like rerolls on failed attempts in the mech because the AI may be able to correct you. Mm-hmm. And also, the AI can give you bonus experience after your mm-hmm. initial encounter because the AI has been taking records and can bring you up to date with better battle strategies. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the mech creation end of things, um, is it a case where there's where there's a base frame that you're that you're customizing, or is it complete freeform? It is complete freeform. Now, in 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 that partic- in that particular um, regard, even though it's freeform, do you do you intend on having a few pre uh, a few um, pre gen loadouts to kind of demonstrate some starting points? Yes, there will be in the finished document. There will be three main builds that you can kind of like you know run into in the world mm-hmm. um in the advanced version which is the one you're getting there will be five and then in the kickstarter only version with those same five will be present mm-hmm. and it'll also go into detail about you know here's your mech here's what you want to build with your mech you don't mm-hmm. want to use a mech here try some of these nice cars and maybe a tank yeah now when it comes now, when it com- when it comes to when it comes to the different makes, um, is the main difference between them the um, the we- the weapon the amount of weapon slots that they that they'll potentially have. Um, one of the main differences between them is a battle mech is bigger than a scouting mech. It is less mobile, and it will have more weapons, and it has thicker armor. Mm-hmm. Um. Also, certain mech types have caps on what their stats can be. So a battle mech can have a higher core score than a scouting mech, but a scouting mech can have a higher thruster score than a combat mech. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the act when it comes to the action economy of in- of encounters within crash within um, within crushing thunder. How how does how does that go about? Is it a case where there's a set of action points that you have, or do you have a different setup? Um, the main setup is as it stands now, is you have your movement action and you have an attack action in your turn. Um, the turns go in a you basically roll a thrusters, which would be two d six plus your thruster score mm-hmm. against. The agility of the dinosaur, whoever gets highest, you know, a very D&D scaled initiative. But once that's set in stone, it alternates. It'll go player, enemy, player, enemy. And it'll basically be, you know, where are you moving? What are you shooting? Next person. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is to keep it quick. And the R&D team is constantly coming up with different things that could be added to it or different ways of playing it if you wanted it to be faster or more story driven, you know, constantly thinking. Yeah. Now something something that I'm curious something that I'm curious about when it comes to we- when it comes to weaponry is the is um 
the is the t is the type of ammunition that goes about cuz yeah you have the heavy assault gun in the example given what i'm curious of, what i'm curious about is are th is are there going to be some equivalent to energy weapons or are most of it just solid projectiles um there are um beam weapons mm -hmm. as well as like a light lightning guns and flamethrowers not so many, not so much flamethrowers outside in the elemental wastes because you may end up healing or not even affecting, but lightning, plasma, other things like that are present. Mm -hmm. And since since you since you have some familiarity with um, with Mech Warrior and BattleTech, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if the Alpha Strike is a possibility or some equivalent of it. You mean pulling out a big beam sword and smashing something to death? No, the alpha strike is fire all the guns. <laughs> oh, that the oh yes, the the barrage. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can barrage things to death. Mm -hmm. um, now that would be a instance where you know rolling a one would be bad, be very bad. But yeah. You can alpha strike, you can barrage things to death. I don't think in that actual image for the Kickstarter where he's fighting that elemental Tyrannus that he has barrage capabilities, so he's probably going to have to move and shoot. Mm -hmm. Technically, in that starting image, that mech pilot is screwed because that is an elemental Tyrannus, and it is usually you want to be either high level, which he could be high level and doing good, or you want to be in something that can alpha strike, so to speak. Yeah. Now, something that something that I'm I'm um a bit a bit curious on because you has there's the men, there's the mention of um of getting of getting e of getting eaten by element getting eaten by elemental dinosaurs. Um, do you can. Where would you rate the level of um, lethality when it comes to encounters? I'm glad you ask. Um, the rating of lethality that I would put on this is... Now, when you say lethality, I'm assuming that you mean the lethality for players, not so much how quickly do you kill the enemies. Yes. All right, the lethality for players is, depending how it ultimately pans out, should be relatively low, but not impossible. Basically, like, the dinos will do damage, and if you don't recognize that they are, you know, dealing you little pings of damage... They will quickly add up, and then you'll have to bail out, and then it's just you versus this thing. Yeah. Um. Now, when whenever whenever I've seen mech, whenever I've seen mech games, there's always there's always a tendency, especially in the way a lot of people write mech adventures, to have a lot of the more dramatic encounters f um, focused entirely on the mech. Um. Is it po is it possible in the, is it possible in this for there to be engagements um, outside of the mech and just with just with the pilots? Oh yes, of course. I've actually been like in my play testing, which I've been doing today. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually just all the pilot. Um, are you aware of the game Seven Days to Die? Yes. Think of it like that. There are certain areas, well, minus the zombies, of course, um, where Erd has... So, in this world, I don't know if you've read through or if it says anything, um, troglodytes are basically the chosen race of Erd. They came up out of the ground, and so they're taking man's place. Well, some of them that are loyal to him have basic, you know, slave camps where humans are enslaved to make weapons, bullets... And rations, and it's like, well, why would they do this? Because Erd likes to taunt humans, and so he will actually take these supplies and put them in buildings so that humans have to get out of the mechs, go into the building, search for it, collect the supplies to basically survive. Mm -hmm. And so half the game can be played, or more, completely without a mech. I mean, if you're living in a uh, arena city, 
You could get involved in the criminal underworld or the politics of the arena city, never see an elemental dinosaur or a mech and be completely playing it as, you know, a cop in the city. Mm -hmm. So the door's open. It's just these things are here outside the walls if you want to take advantage of them. And there will be places where getting out of your mech and potentially getting captured is 100% possible. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, what what would you what would you say have been some have been some of the learning experiences you've ta you've taken from the from your experiences playtesting? Well, some of the things that I've learned from playtesting is the dice pyramid does achieves the initial thought that you do feel powerful rolling it, and it can be fun. Mm -hmm. um, but like in a lot of these games where, and it's hard to get away from, it can feel clunky at times. You know, you just want to take a shot, but you have to roll it out and then, you know, extra rolls. It's really, the dice pyramid will appeal to the mindset of, to borrow from Warhammer, daka, daka, daka. Yeah. You know, you want to shoot a lot, you want to feel like you did a big hit, it will appeal. But it the only... I guess I'm revealing my Achilles heel, is that it does take more time. There are more steps than may be necessary in order to achieve a different result. So, mm -hmm. so pardon me, there are other core aspects being pitched in order to aid this and potentially what could happen is is that the document actually gives multiple ways of playing the game it's like you know if you like shooting a lot use this mm -hmm. if you like speed do it this way and um one of the things that was pitched forward was a um initiative battle and it was very interesting and what they did in that was they would roll 2d6 one represented the party as a whole and one represented the enemies as a whole and so say it was your turn mr milder mm -hmm. uh you would roll and if you won the initiative everyone would take their turn based on the difference so if say i rolled a five on initiative and the enemy rolled a three on initiative that's a two plus so you'd look at your abilities and anything that could activate on a two or less you could do as your action and everybody would go through, target the enemy they want to, or AoE, whatever, do their abilities, and then it would be the next initiative roll. It's much faster. Um, and to make a long story short, um, the enemies never roll an initiative. It's all just the players trading the dice, and if when they roll the dice, if the enemy gets higher, the enemies go. Mm -hmm. And you can use what would be called, um, let's use power, for lack of a better term, luck, whatever you want to call it, to re-roll and potentially you can act multiple times in a row and so in that you can be pumping out a lot of damage at a cost mm -hmm. and even when you're outside the mech you can you know win initiative battles which you should be dead yeah does that make sense yeah and that br that brings me to one other question and maybe the whole power thing answers this but do you, but when it comes to a extra effort type of type of mechanic that's often in a lot of um, RPGs, does Crushing Thunder have that? Like pushing the roll, so to speak. It can either be pushing, um, it can either be pushing the roll, or it can be giving the players a temporary edit button. Or, um, in the case of say Warham Warhammer um, role play, a ch a means to cheat. It means to um, bail themselves out. Plot, plot armor. Mm -hmm. um, the crushing thunder in its current iteration. Now, in the initiative, in the initiative battle system, which the R and D department brought forward, you would have you know luck or power that you could burn in order to try to take multiple turns in a row and unscrew yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, in the current version with the dice pyramid there is not so much of a venue for players to um unscrew themselves you can spend your stat points you can spend stat points to give yourself bonuses so 
if you want to like take a hit for the day to your agility, you can take less damage equal to your agility score from attacks. Now that's not in the pamphlet, that's in the actual document that's being written. And I will actually send you that link for your own viewing pleasure if you'd mm -hmm. like. I would I would certainly appreciate that down the road down the road. Obvi obviously not not in the immediacy because I can't I can read something fast, but I can't read something that fast. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Just an offer. Mm -hmm. and I do. I do appreciate that. Um, now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the um el the elemental nature of of the different um the different di the different dinos, I can see with a good chunk of the art that it's not that it's not just T Rexes, even though they're probably the equivalent of dragons in this particular setting i.e. the um big i.e. the big one t to end all big ones that nobody wants to deal with but mm -hmm. is it a, is it a case where you ended up giving a specific element to each type of dinosaur or are there elemental variants of all of them there are elemental variants of all of them i was actually going to include in the different version of the game itself a dinosaur builder like it'll have the basic dinosaurs but it'll have the elements what the element does and you can basically what that type of dinosaur does you know like its abilities or whatever and you can slap elements on them and you'll so you could make like i have the picture of the water and ice styracosaur there mm -hmm. you could do that uh, you could make one that's like water and fire if you wanted or earth and just rock instead of just water and ice and given given the fact that the that these elemental dinosaurs are a case of escalation um have you cons have you considered putting in at 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 a high at a higher tier when it comes to campaigns that people that people will eventually get access to weapons that are specifically designed around counteracting elements now, one of the things about that gets into kind of the spirituality of the gaming world. So yeah, I had one person ask if it was potentially possible to, say, find Gaia or some of these spirits that are generally believed to be representative elements but are, like, you know, religion's kind of scarce in this world where Erd has suddenly flipped it on its head, and that's actually a vein where players can begin to discover it as to weapons that can directly counter the elements it really comes down to just physics mm -hmm. it's like if you have a bomb that explodes like you know fire extinguisher gas then you're going to do extra damage to fire-based creatures if you have a say something that sucks the air out of a, a of like a vacuum bomb or a vacuum gun you can devastate wind-based creatures pretty well mm -hmm. um etc if you have like a acid gun you can destroy earth-based creatures except those that have acid themselves like mm -hmm. the tyrannus but you you understand what i'm saying the more creative you can be with what you with your loadout the more stuff you can overcome and that brings, and that brings me to another that brings me to another question and that is within weapon customization are you planning on having a system within within the book so that people can try and devise um, customized weaponry? Yes, I will. What I'm hoping for is now. This is going to be a good bit of work, but it's worth it. Is a list, and in some of the other games that I've designed, I have lists like these where you can take certain aspects um, for, like, say, a point buy. So, like, say, each gun or weapon is 30 points and you can look through different effects and drawbacks and if you can balance it you can make it mm -hmm. as long as you can pay for it yeah and i'm and i'm get i'm guessing that um i'm guessing that adva that when it comes to the advancement loop it's more of you do, you you go you go out and do you go out and do jobs you and um you get paid which get which get which is gonna have which is gonna get you renowned so that you can do more dangerous jobs so you can get paid even more. Right. Um, but also remember when I said that the elemental lord of metal was on human side. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there is something with that. You can get renown from the elemental lord of metal. And he can actually intervene on your behalf in certain areas. Like, say you go out and happen to kill an elemental Tyrannus. Um, that may get you noticed by him, mm-hmm. that you are a powerful weapon against his brother. And give now when it com- how would that how would that per- that particular notice how would that um, manifest? Um, something that that could manifest is the ability, almost like a supernatural ability, to heal your mech, mm-hmm. giving like your mech more human aspects because he commands metal. So, for example. If he, if you have his favor, and there'll be a list of things you can have for his favor, one is mech healing, and the mech will heal itself. You don't have to repair it. It will heal like a natural organism. I'm, ge- I'm guessing that the more, f- I'm guessing that someone who has more and more favor with him, their particular mech will start will start to be a little less on the traditionally stompy end of the equation. Yes. Um. I'm just, I'm or, just visualizing one who has a lot, who has a lot of favor, whose mech is, whose mech is effectively a bunch of nanites or something. Or you could have like the mech go from like it is in the picture to like a floating Doctor Manhattan looking mech thing that has you know just electromagnetic power out the wazoo and is throwing lightning bolts at dinosaurs. Yeah, because who didn't love the lightning gun in Quake? Yeah. Um, just just put Zeus in a bottle. It'll be okay. Hey, it worked for a medieval. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, when it now when it comes to when it comes to uh, when it comes to automatic weaponry, sometimes sometimes I've seen games that will have that the the that one of the downsides you have to watch out for with automatic weaponry is the risk of jamming. Um, do you have do you have a setup in do you have a setup in place when it comes to jamming or misfires or the like? Um, let me answer that real quickly. In the pyramid system, uh, that is rolling a one. So you know, say like it has J two. That means if you roll two ones in your pyramid, the weapon jams. Mm-hmm. It stops. Um, in the initiative battle. That is more determined by using the weapon in a way it's not supposed to be used. So, for example, um, if you're just if it says it targets two people, but you're choosing to target a single person twice, you make a roll, and if you fail the roll, the gun jams. All right, that ma- that makes sense. Um... Now, I, now I've now with a lot of with a lot of the weapon approaches, we've talked about the kind of standard ones, fl- flamethrowers, solid projectiles, that kind of thing. Um, when it comes to the weapon list, do you have missiles? You do have missiles. Oh. Oh, and I'm, gu- I'm guess I'm guessing with I'm guessing with those is the case of they're going to do a lot of damage, but they're also but you also have to watch out for splash damage. That is true. Um, let, I can explain, break it down. Um, I'm just going to say S1 and S2 because mm-hmm. the R&D department likes to mess with me. Um, in S1, which is the dice pyramid, if you are firing a missile or large explosive projectile at a, at a dino, um, you get some an effect that's known as crushing. Mm-hmm. You know, the crushing thunder. And the first success you roll is rolled again. So, for example, if you rolled a three, a four, basically all your successes become exploding Mm -hmm. for the first time that they're they're rolled. So if you roll five, four, three, you get to roll all of them again, and if you get a six, they continue to explode. All right. So, and... There is AOE damage. Like, the missile will blow up in a large area, and if your friends are in that area, well, they're going to get hit with a missile. Mm-hmm. Um, in the second, um, which is the initiative, mostly missiles and other strong weaponry, 
can only be fired with a significant initiative advantage. So say the party rolls a six and the enemy has a one. So you have like a gap of five. Well, you might be able to fire a missile. And in that case, it's going to do a ton of damage to most all of the enemies and probably wipe them out. But in that, it's more of you. the missile is kind of like the crit. Mm. We did super good. Now we get to hit him with a missile. Speaking of speaking of draw, speaking of drawbacks, um, I'd like to pick your brain a bit about the equip about the equivalent to miniguns, which <laughs> in in uh, the drawback that's the drawback that I've often seen with with miniguns or their equivalent is one of two things: either a they eat up ammo ridiculously fast, or b you have to watch out for heat management. All right. So this world's version of a minigun is probably a minigun because if I call it anything else, I'll get like hit by Warhammer or something else that randomly has that name tacked onto a gun that fires really fast. So <laughs> I'm calling it miniguns for now. Um, it's not so much in the pyramid system. Um, you don't really have to worry about either one of those things. The minigun is so you see that gun that it has in the actual uh picture that he's fighting the tyrannus with yeah that is a mini that is a mini gun um that chamber that is attached is an entire barrel of bullets and each time he fires it empties that barrel and drops it mm -hmm. so it fires so you may have a mini gun and it only has three shots but that's three full barrels of bullets that it's unloading each time so with that, you can effectively, each shot with that weapon is three normal attacks. So you could put those three into one target. You could target two people and do double to one person. The only problem is, is because it's a barrel, um, if something attacks your gun, either A you know, the bullets all spill out and you have to resort to melee, or B, if, like, a energy beam from, like, say, a baryonyx made of gold that can harness static electricity and fire plasma beams, um, if that hits your barrel, if the GM just happens to be, you know, naughty about it and say, oh, by the way, then all that's going to explode like bullet-filled grenades. I got, I got you. And speaking of, speaking of that, um, when it comes to mech, when it comes to mech damage, is that is it a, is it an overall affair or is it, or is it somewhat localized? Um, the way I have it in the system right now, and this, like I said, may change depending on the uh, R and D, what it pushes forward is, it is a overall. So, for example, we have like a battle mech sitting at the highest HP you can get in the game at 45. Mm -hmm. And since most attacks average in either 4 to 5 damage, um, and it'll take less damage from things that are smaller than it or less powerful. That's where the armor and power system come in. Uh, you're looking at taking maybe 18 to 20 plus hits from you know, machine guns or any type of weapon. Uh, before it just phases out, so to speak. You know what I mean? And one of the things in the game as it stands right now, because it's supposed to be made simple and easy for players, is that all weapons can potentially do the same amount of damage, just depending on their power, to see if they get past the armor. Because you could roll um, a rocket launcher and a machine gun you're still rolling the same pyramid. They could come out doing the same damage, but whereas the rocket could do damage to a bunch of people and the machine gun can hammer down on one person, nobody's weapon is particularly useless, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, someone with uh, their mech has a shotgun rolling up with someone that has a minigun is not necessarily going to do less damage. It's just their what they bring to the table is something that's going to overcome some elemental defense. So, for example, if you're using a minigun against an air-based dinosaur, it's not going to do anything. 
There's nothing to disrupt it. They're just going to go straight through it. Mm-hmm. Where the shotgun has an explosion, which can actually damage something made out of air and tear apart the current. Mm-hmm. So some of it is that... You know, someone might say, hey, why does my big powerful gun do the same as this gun? Well, you didn't see all the effects tied to that powerful gun that you didn't see to the little gun. You know what I mean? Sure, they can potentially do the same amount of damage, but they're not going to overcome the same number of defenses. Yeah. Now, what do you estimate the total page count to be for this? Well, currently I am working on one of the rewrites of the system document, taking in the new information and everything that I'm getting. I'm thinking that when it's said and done, we're looking at anywhere between 30, maybe 30 pages or more. I'll smush it down if I can. All right. Sounds, sounds like it sounds like it's 30 pages. Isn't, isn't too terrible. Um, And some of those, Go ahead. Some of those will be the map. Mm -hmm. And like the maps and the creature compendium. I say, as far as raw system goes, just system explanations, maybe five to seven pages before you get to like customization. Yeah. And for what it's worth, the core rules for Mork Borg were originally one page. (laughs) (laughs) So, good good company in that regard. Um, Yes. Now, now, um, do you, I realize, I realize it's going to be a while before, before the, before the due date, but do you have plans on release, aside from the document that's on the Kickstarter page, do you have any plans on putting out some sort of quick start version of the game in the coming weeks? Um, yes. With this new, um, with kind of like the new mechanics that are being put forth by the R and D team, I may release, you know, um, documents that people can kind of like get quick start or maybe even put them up on drive through RPG as, you know, like a pay what you want, you know, basically get them for free Mm -hmm. and be able to test out the game before it actually comes out to see what type of mechanics the player base actually wants to use. Like what, makes them feel like they are controlling the crushing thunder. All right, I got I got you. Well, with with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness here. Oh, anytime. I I loved every minute of it. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I will remember that next time and bring my own. (laughs) And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.